Today, I'm going to continue my discussion about software architecture, diving into the concept of quality attributes. Uh, this lecture begins with a quote by William Foster, where he says, quality is never an accident. Instead, quality is always a result of high attention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, skillful execution. You know, basically, you're not going to randomly achieve quality. Instead, you're going to have to intend to work at it, put in effort, and then your result will be quality. So we're going to talk a little bit about a number of different concepts related to quality attributes. And qual but first, we're going to dive into the concept of different types of requirements. We'll talk about functional requirements, and then we'll talk about quality attributes, which are often sometimes known under the name non-functional uh, requirements. Um, and, and quality attributes, um, there's a wide range of quality attributes, but the primary ones are things like performance, security, availability, and so on. So we'll dive into some considerations for quality attributes. We'll talk about how you can describe quality attribute, attribute requirements, and we'll talk about how to achieve quality attributes in an architecture through architecture tactics. So in general, system requirements can be categorized as functional requirements, quality attribute requirements or non-functional requirements and constraints. So functional requirements state what the system must do, how it should behave or react to some sort of runtime stimulus. For example, if I press this button, the car should move. Uh, that's a functional requirement. A quality attribute requirement, on the other hand, uh, is going to qualify or annotate a functional requirement. So how fast the function must be performed, how resilient the system must be to, a, to an error in the input, how easy the function is to learn, etc. So going back to the idea of you push the button and the car moves, well, how fast does the car move after you push the button? How long does it take to react? How often uh, when you press the button, will it actually respond to being pressed? How likely is it to learn that when you, we need to press this button? All those things are quality attributes. Constraints are design decisions that have already been made. Um, so, that's really our three categories of requirements, stuff we've already decided upon, which is constraints, and then functional requirements and the quality attribute requirements. So as I said, functionality is the ability of the system to do the work that we intend. Uh, but there's a lot of ways in which you could design a system to achieve functionality. And so architecture generally isn't gonna be what constrains your functionality. Instead, architecture is gonna be what enables us to achieve our quality attributes. Um, so let's talk about quality attributes. So for example, if our functional requirement is when the user presses a green button, the options dialog begins, then our quality attribute for performance would describe how quickly the dialog appears. Our quality attribute for availability would describe how often the function can fail. And if it fails and it's down, how quickly we can repair it. Uh, a usability quality attribute for uh, this requirement might describe how easy it is to learn to press the green button. Um, now, when you're dealing with quality attributes, your definition should be testable. You don't want to have a requirement that says a system will be modifiable, because what does that mean? So your quality attribute has to be scoped and narrowly defined enough that you can tell whether or not that requirement has been achieved. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that um, you know you could argue whether a particular requirement belongs to one or more different areas. And that's not really important. The important thing is to describe these requirements. So for example, if you have a requirement to prevent a denial of service attack, it doesn't really matter whether you categorize that requirement in availability to avoid system downtime or in security because it's a security aspect or some other area like performance usability. The important thing is to identify the concerns, not really to categorize the concerns.
One other aspect of this is that in talking about these different categories, though, like performance and security and so on, each of those areas tends to have its own vocabulary or terminology. And so the people who work in the security field tend to describe things slightly differently from the people who work in the performance field. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're working with these requirements. Now, one way to deal with the overlapping concerns and, you know, having a, a requirement that's not testable is to uh, use um, this idea, concept of the quality attribute scenario. But uh, dealing with the vocabulary, um, you know, is to basically focus in on uh, concepts that are fundamental to that uh, area and not worry about some of the specialized words that all, may also appear in that area. So here is this concept of the scenario for describing a quality attribute. And the basic idea is something is going to cause um, an event. So we have the stimulus that's causing an event and uh, we have a response to that stimulus. And then our measurement of that response determines whether or not the quality attribute was achieved. So for example, let's say for example that our requirement is for 99% availability. That is 99% uptime for the system. Then what you can do is when there is a failure and the system goes down, you can measure how long the system's down. And if the system is no longer up for 99%, then you can say, hey, the system is not meeting the requirement of 99% uptime. On the other hand, if when you measure all the downtime, the system has been up for more than 99%, then you can say, yeah, this system is re reaching its goals and we're satisfying the quality attribute for 99% availability. So, um, so again, we've got this area, we've got a stimulus, something causes a stimulus, we respond to the stimulus and we measure that response. And again, all this is done in the context of a software architecture. Um, and you can have a general quality attribute scenario, which describes generally what happens, and then a concrete scenario, which describes it for a specific system. Uh, so, all right, that, so that describes the concept of, you know, a system with a software architecture achieving these quality attributes. But what if you analyze your system and you determine that the system isn't currently capable of meeting the, the quality attribute, but you wanna modify the system to, to ensure that it does achieve it. Well, there are ways that software engineers have developed over time to modify our systems to achieve quality attributes, even if the system doesn't currently meet, achieve it. Um, and generally these are known as design patterns and architecture tactics. And these are design techniques that a ar software architect can use to, which, to achieve a quality attribute. Um, tactics are smaller than the design patterns. Design patterns tend to be relatively complicated uh, and can achieve a number of different goals simultaneously. Tactics tend to achieve just a single quality attribute. And really, these are techniques that software architects have been using for decades. Um, and so really what's going on is when you're using a tactic or a design pattern, you're not actually creating it for the first time. Instead, you're using uh, something someone else used and they described and you're applying it to your circumstances. So a design pattern describes a recurring design problem and presents a, a proven solution to that problem. And so we can achieve our quality attributes either by implementing design patterns or implementing uh, these quality attribute tactics, which are smaller than design patterns. And you can actually think of a design pattern in some cases being a collection of several tactics uh, working together. Now, one other aspect of these architecture tactics is they often have trade-offs involved. For example, let's suppose we wanna achieve high availability. And the way we decide to do that is we're, we decide that uh, our system currently only has a single database and if we add a second database, now we're gonna have redundancy and we'll be more likely to achieve our high availability requirement. Well, adding that second database may have some trade-offs. 
first. It may be more expensive to have two databases in one. Um, there may be some latency involved in having that second database running in the network. It might slow the system down a little bit. Um, so you know, these are potential trade-offs that you know result that uh, you'll have even though you're increasing your availability. And so that's something to think about whenever we're adding one of these architecture tactics or design patterns is they're not free. There is a cost for it either you know that's going to impact the system. And so you do have to think carefully about whether it's worth it. In many cases, the value is worth it, but it's not always worth it. So why use both tactics and design patterns? Well, as I mentioned, design patterns are complicated uh, compared to the architect architecture tactics. Um, they have a lot of great capabilities, but uh, they're gonna be more work to bring in. And so again, it's a trade-off. You don't get as much benefit from a tactic, but maybe you don't need all the ability, capabilities that a design pattern offers. And maybe a tactic is actually what you want and it's in your budget. So one thing you can do is you can look at a questionnaire for a quality attribute when you're analyzing your design decisions. Let's say we have a questionnaire for availability uh, and you know, a questionnaire will ask, have you identified all the single points of failure? Have you considered redundancy? You know, it'll ask various questions like that to enable you to help analyze as an architect whether or not your system will achieve high availability and whether or not there are some basic design decisions you can make to ensure that you do reach your goals. And so working with uh, some of these tactics based questionnaires will be pretty helpful. Um, and opportunities for analyzing whether your architecture is going to achieve uh, your goals can come up at many different points in the software development lifecycle, from when you're first beginning to design throughout the software lifecycle. Now, one of the things that uh, you'll discover as you start analyzing software architectures to determine whether or not they're gonna achieve their quality attribute goals is that depending on the maturity of your architecture uh, will determine in cer to a certain extent how much confidence you have in your analysis. You know, if it's the very, very early days of your design, you may not have a lot of confidence in your analysis. If the system's already been built and deployed, then you can have high confidence that what you're analyzing is based on the real system. But these questionnaires can still help you before that system's been built because they can give you things to consider so you know ahead of time, uh, as again, when I mentioned my, my availability example, whether or not you've actually uh, put in enough redundancy throughout your system or whether you still have single points of failure that can cause your entire system to crash. And we're going to take a look at some of these questionnaires in subsequent software architecture lectures. But generally, the idea is for each question in the questionnaire, um, the architect or the analyst is going to describe things like uh, whether this particular system is uh, using various architecture tactics in the architecture, whether there's risks involved in using or not using the tactics. Um, we'll look at various design decisions that were made to achieve those tactics or design patterns. And that's going to be useful for auditing later on to determine, you know, how we were using these tactics and what was the goals of the decisions we made. So this has been a brief uh, lecture taking a look at quality attributes in software architecture. We talked about the fact that there's really three main types of requirements for a software architecture. You've got your functional requirements that are satisfied by building a capability in the system to achieve functionality. Like when you press the green button, the car will move. Uh, quality attributes, which are really those capabilities that are delivered by the architecture. Things like performance and security. And finally, we've got constraints, which are design decisions that have already been made. And then we talked about the fact that our quality attributes in our subsequent lectures are going to be described using this quality attribute scenario 
where we've got some stimulus, then we have a response to the stimulus by the system, and then we measure that response, and the measurement of the response determines whether or not the quality attribute was satisfied or not. So for example, for availability, we might measure downtime as our response. And if our response, if our downtime goes beyond a certain limit, we're no longer satisfying our quality attribute uh, response measure. So again, architecture tactics are design decisions that uh, can affect a quality attribute. They usually focus on a single quality attribute. For example, redundant databases might be an architecture tactic for availability. Uh, and you can think of design patterns as, as packages of tactics. And we're gonna provide some checklists that enable architects to determine whether or not the architecture is actually gonna be achieving a particular quality attribute. So thanks again for watching this short presentation on understanding quality attributes. Tune in next time when we'll dive deeper into software architecture.